Hello, this is David Thompson from the Fraser Valley in British Columbia with a message for all those that are hungry and thirsty for what is real, for reality, for ultimate meaning and purpose in your life. And so for you that are new, I want to refer you to my website at ultimatemeaning.com. There I have a flip book which you can read with very original writing by the gifting of the Spirit of God through me to you that answers many very hard questions and also has links that are highlighted in red. Those are links to many YouTube videos that are very profound and amazing from many fields of science and archaeology confirming the reality of what I am sharing here about which is an ultimate source of reality, of all reality, that is an ultimate manifestation and perfection of love that is the very source of love, which is the source of all there is. And the reason for which all things exist and consist and for which you exist. So check out my website at ultimatemeaning.com there. There's also videos that show by myself, that show for many fields of science, as well as the ones that are linked in that flip book. They show for many fields of science. The reality of God. And expose evolution as a mastery of deception. Of course, we're living in a time when it's totally collapsed. You can actually say the last nail has been nailed into evolution, that it is now dead because of some very profound and amazing discoveries, which I'm going to share in this introduction here. Who knows, it might end up being a whole video in itself, this introduction, because of some of the exciting things I discovered this week and also from the other week, that I had mentioned as well. So, last week I was sharing a special video about the amazing discoveries in the genes that now through the Y chromosome they have found they can consistently trace time back and that it's verified over and over again, scientifically verified by the things they're discovering that are very objective in archaeology and so on as they reference the various things that, verif that are verified with the timing of what they're tracing with the genes. And they know that man only goes back to around 6,000 years. They can trace your genealogy right back to the three sons of Noah, whether you come from Shem or Japheth or Ham. There's so much. They've recovered the Indian history of the Indian civilization. They know they came here 900 AD, coming most likely, I believe they've traced it through Alaska there, and they've also found that their one tribe that did record a lot of their history and people said wasn't true is actually been verified by genetics to be true. And so they have a lot of their history already figured out through the genetics. So this is a very powerful discovery that totally destroys the theory of evolution in itself. It's a major historical discovery. It's like the Rosetta Stone, stone but greater. And then you have other aspects that you can check out with, with the genes that are very amazing like the discovery of Lut Montagnier. That's a link in my flip book there that you can look up. He discovered that the genes, which are so complicated, with information, I think they said there was enough information in the gene to fill a whole stack of books, travel all the way to the moon and back 50 times. I saw that in one video. I was amazed. The information that is stored in the genes in one, you know, you can't even see a cell, obviously. And in one cell, you take one gene and it's going to stretch out 
six feet long with this information. All of this amazing coding that is what will create an identical you or, or an identical plant with its own uniqueness, of course, as I am unique and totally different than everyone else in the world, so are you. And so they found that these genes, Lut Montagnier could put a signal, you could put one tube, you got the DNA, the, you know, the gene and all that in there, the DNA in one tube, and in the other tube there's nothing. And the DNA sends a frequency through the tube into the air and through the glass into the other tube where there's nothing and creates DNA. Out of nothing, all there is is water in the other tube. That totally in itself blows a hole in the theory of evolution. So many discoveries of recent like that. I mean, the fact that they've found blood and dinosaurs and flexible flesh and dinosaurs, which can only survive, I don't know exactly how long, but it's just in the thousands of years, probably not more than 10,000 years. No, every field of science has shown the layers, all of that, finding a footprint, the trilobite in the footprint, a human footprint, actually of a shoe at the lowest Cambrian layer. And they see, there's all, I mean, I could go on and on. But what I want to share with you is what I discovered this week that's so amazing. And that's about the James Webb Telescope which is an amazing telescope. I don't know how I missed this in the news. This is a telescope that's a hundred times more powerful than the Hubble. Well, the discoveries are have totally destroyed the Big Bang Theory. Oh, some people are scratching with their fingers to still hang on to the Big Bang Theory, but their own top experts are saying it's dead. And I'm going to show you some of the evidence of that because of what they've seen in outer space. It's blowing them away. So let me just share a bit about this James Webb telescope if you've not heard about it. So we're going to go. I have a little bit of information up here on it that I've taken in notes, and I will show you some videos as well. There is an expert that's one of their top big people for the Big Bang and everything. His name is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it perfect, but... Michael Kaku. He looks like he's Japanese. One of the YouTube videos I just looked at is called Time Does Not Exist. Webb Telescope Proved Us Wrong. Well, in that video, they point out 16 things of the Big Bang Theory that have been totally destroyed by the discovery from this amazing telescope. And this telescope has been sent into outer space a million miles away from the Earth. It had to be created to be at a temperature out there in outer space of minus 327 Celsius. The lens was made, pre-made to shrink to that size when it got out to those cold temperatures and is not made of glass but of some kind of a metal salt. Specially made so that it would be far superior to the Hubble. In fact, one of the lenses has to be cooled down to minus 447 Fahrenheit to take these amazing pictures and be able to pick up things that you could never pick up. And what did they expect to find out, the secular scientists out there? They expected if the Big Bang was true, they would find fewer galaxies at greater distances and none beyond the 14-point redshift. The redshift is how fast I believe something is. I believe I remember right traveling away from you. The farthest and earliest galaxies would have low mass and be clumpy and irregular. That's what they expected to see. The farthest galaxies would have only um, what they call pop three stars and no heavy elements. There's three categories of stars, I guess, that goes from pop one all the way up to pop three. Well, they didn't find any of that. In fact, the creationists predicted what they would find because they believe in God and everything that the creationists predicted became true. For example, this one creationist, the 
if I have his name, Dr. Jason. Is his name, I forgot. I don't have his last name right up here right now. Dr. Jason Lyle, yes, it's down here. All predictions of Dr. Jason Lyle right at the bottom here. I'll move this up. Came true. What did he predict? There would be lots of galaxies at great distances even beyond the 14-point redshift. The farthest galaxies would be fully formed and massive and well-structured. Well, that's what they found. The farthest galaxies would have pop one and pop three stars, like our own. And there would be all the detectical, detect, they would detect heavy elements in them. All the heavy elements. Whoa, they found all of this is so. Oh, oh, oh. Secularists will respond to their failed predictions with statements like this. They even predicted that. Web discoveries that galaxies form much earlier than previously thought. Well, what it discovered is that your Big Bang Theory is not true. Because your top experts are coming out, and I'm going to show you the video on it to back it up, okay? Not just that, the video. Now that's a song we're gonna sing later. Here we have one of your top experts. Let me just pop this up here. I'll have to minimize myself for a moment here. So we'll do that. And we have here your top expert. Michael Caillou breaks silence on the new discovery at Universe's Edge by James Webb Telescope. He discovers that time doesn't exist. Whoa! That's what he thinks. It's proved us wrong, he says. This is their expert. In fact, he believes now that we're inside a black hole because people don't want to believe in God. Well, if you don't want to believe in God, maybe you can convince yourself to believe that you're in a black hole now. The Big Bang was wrong. Wow. It says it right here. Michael Kaku, their top, I guess, scientific expert on Big Bang and all of that. The Big Bang was wrong. In fact, I saw a heading that said he was crying because they lied to us from 1931 about all these things. Wow. You got to watch some of these videos. They're very amazing. This proves God. This is Michael Kaku saying this proves God. There are atheists that believed in the Big Bang. The Big Bang isn't true. 16 points of the Big Bang have been devastated by the discovery of the James Webb Telescope. And here he is saying, right in the headlines there, this proves God. Now, these are very interesting videos to watch. Just type in his name and the James Webb Space Telescope, which is an amazing work of art. And then I saw something that even, was even more amazing that is recent, recent within a few hours. And, and it was a, kind of an added shock onto all of these discoveries. If I can pick it up here in one of the headlines. The Star Orion suddenly is changing from a 300 increase in brightness. And it's worrying this expert, Mako Kaku, because it could cause a nova explosion. You know what that would fulfill? It would fulfill the prophecies in the Bible that in the last days of the sun would become black as sackcloth and the moon as blood. Of course, there's another thing that's happening that could also fulfill it, and that is that there is an asteroid heading straight for the earth, that according to the prophecy of Tim Horn, a man of God, whose prophecies have all come true, and he spoke things in detail that everyone laughed and mocked him at, that could never happen, such as that the Pope would resign, and he mentioned the exact month, and it was verified to be true. And of course, all the media was saying, what insider told you all these things? God told him it. He actually died, and the Lord showed him these things. And he's a man of God who was part of the Pentecostal assemblies at one time, who gave many prophecies to the Pentecostal assemblies, and all 12 of them came true. 
And he says that this asteroid will hit the Earth on April the 13th of 2029. It will be visible by 2027 to everyone. But here we have another thing that could fulfill that prophecy. NASA is very worried that this one, which is a a pulp, a pulpus or something like that. It, it's the name of the god of destruction, of the Egyptian god of destruction. That asteroid, if it hit the earth, and according to what he saw, it broke up in two. Part of it hit the land, the other part hit the sea, and the part that hit the land caused tremendous volcanic eruptions, and the part that hit the sea caused tremendous stuff to go up into the air and the atmosphere and of course the sun got covered with it all so we see that the time of the consummation of all things there's signs that are inevitable that are pointing towards the consummate purpose of all things being fulfilled very soon and i'm pointing out some of them here to you so I want to share with you now that are new also, and I will bring myself back up. I want to share with you that are new about who the one true eternal God could only be. He could only be an ultimate perfection of love that is the very source of love, and let me explain this. And of course, I've written this in a book, which you can also get on the internet. It's a lot smaller book, of course. I'm gonna, I do have a big one I can put up there pretty quickly, but I wanna add a lot of these new discoveries to it. But the one I have up there is called Evolution Delusion Solution. It's not a big, thick book. I don't even know if I have it here. Of course, my major book that I have is on the afterlife, titled Afterlife Incredible Irrefutable. That's 368 eight pages of a very large paperback book. And it's exceptionally interesting, and I didn't do my marketing right, and I just stuck it up there instead of doing things right, and so no one knows about it, and there's no one doing reviews, and yet it's better than the ones that are the best sellers. I've read the best seller from a Christian viewpoint, that is. Fine. Mine's got way more thorough answers and better answers to explain all of these things that people experience when they enter the ultra-real permanent dimension, which is far superior to the physical dimension. Of course, for particle physics has discovered all of these things through the Hadron Collider, which is a 16 billion collider under the Earth that shoots objects at 99.999 whatever the speed of light and then causes them to collide where it causes intensities of heat in those collisions thousands of times hotter than the sun for exact their exact amount. And these explosions are all recorded in chambers of minus 273 Celsius and magnetism. I think it's in the thousands of times greater than the Earth. And they go to mainframe computers around the world and analyze. But what does that mathematical analysis show? It shows as is written in my book, a super intelligent source. And I want to share about this one true God that is the very source of reality, who is and could only be an ultimate perfection of love. So let me describe what this love that is totally pure is like. First of all, it is a quality that always freely chooses of its own self the highest lasting good over any lesser choice because any lesser choice as such would have a measure of corruption in it maybe before i describe this love i should add what i was going to say that i had in the book evolution delusion solution as i promised or i'd forgotten to do that evolutions believe evolutionists believe that everything's evolving to a higher and higher state okay if you believe that through selection and all this then you got to consider that happen in another dimension. For there are all these other dimensions that are far superior to the third dimension, 
like the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh all the way up to the tenth and possibly the eleventh according to some people. Well, then things should have evolved at a time, of course, this would be before sexual reproduction. That's a highly complex system. Anything that can reproduce itself, it would be highly complex. You can't have evolution produce something like the genes that is so complex. And then you could, that could never come about by chance. It's so obvious that you'd have to believe, you'd have to know evolution is a fairy tale of that alone. And so you say everything's evolving, evolving, evolving. Well, if there was something evolving over an infinite amount of time or an unfathomable amount of time, it should have evolved to its apex, to its maximum, which would have negated the need for evolution because it would have transcended the powers of time and space and chance in such a mighty um, apex of perfection. And so it would have never existed and it would have always been that there is this ultimate apex of perfection of a supreme intelligence. And what I'm describing to you, or about to describe to you, is this love, which is, in its essence, the supreme intelligence as well. Because this love has a quality that always chooses the highest lasting good over any lesser choice. And there's nothing more intelligent that could do that, that than something that can do that. It has such purity and integrity that it is a consuming fire of judgment against all that is contrary to this love. Yes, this love has integrity. It's very pure. It will not condone the slightest that is contrary to it. It will not condone corruption. It is the opposite of corruption. It is the destroyer of corruption. And that is the defensive aspect of the love of the one true eternal God. It is represented in the negative symbol which represents an indestructible foundation, which represents cutting off all corruption. Hallelujah. That is the source of reality. Only this could be the source of reality. It allows for creativity to go forth without corruption and ever enlarge without end. Some of those that were before God in heaven and saw God the Father with multitudes worshiping before him after they traveled through a tunnel and saw galaxies and everything else just passing by like snowflakes. They saw out of the mouth of God the Father galaxies coming out of his mouth and being created while they're worshiping before him. And that's in a dimension that is so superior to the physical dimension that there's no way you can put words to describe it in this earthly realm as to how great the love of God is, how awesome it is. It is the very source of all intelligence, of all life, of all the beautiful beings that are there, of angels and myriads of other creations, including creations like onto the earth. And they're all in loving union, playing and worship with each other and worshiping the creator. And they find their ultimate pleasure in worshiping the Creator in absolute awe of how pure and holy he is, that he will not tolerate corruption. You can fall in love with purity when you see that purity brings wholeness. It is what is so beautiful about holiness is that it is holiness that brings wholeness in your inner being. In heaven, there's total wholeness and total fulfillment and pleasures way beyond any temporal sexual pleasures of this world or any other kind of pleasures you can experience in worshiping God. And God created us for his pleasure. All things were created for his pleasure, but we also find our ultimate pleasure in worshiping God and in enjoying the gifts he returns to us that he has created for us to enjoy.
of animals and, of course, of the life and other things in this world. So what I'm sharing here is good news. So I'm describing this love, and I've described the first aspect as representing the negative symbol. Symbol of cutting off corruption, of indestructible foundation. But the negative symbol results also in another symbol being formed out of it, which is the positive symbol or the symbol of the cross. And yes, God's love is so great that he can communicate with his creation. For example, in Genesis 18, he communicates with Abraham. Three angels are at the tent door, a few, maybe 10 feet ahead of him. There are someone, doesn't tell, tell you that specific detail, but does describe these angels. Abraham runs to them. They probably look like human beings. They're very majestic. Bows before him and says, can I make you a meal? He has his servants make a beautiful meal. They eat together outside the tent door. And Abraham addresses one of them. In Genesis 18 is Yahweh, the most sacred name for God, which basically means the I am that I am, the ultimate reality that is transcendent far above creation and separate and beyond it. And the very source of all good. Of course, the source of anything that isn't good comes from the free choices of beings that have rebelled against that ultimate reality, which is the one true God, whose name in the Hebrew is Yahweh, or some call it Yehovah. And the other name in the Hebrew that is often associated with that is Elohim, which means the Almighty, referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And of course, for God to be almighty, he must be in personage in the three ultimate aspects of existence, which are beyond creation as God the Father, which are in creation as God the Son, and which is filling in omnipresence all creation of every dimension of existence from the first to the tenth or whatever other dimensions and every plane and dimension of time. And of course, God can come in many planes of time and intersect our timeline so that he can appear to many at the same time. He can appear to millions and be totally personal with them all at the same time and hear all their prayers totally personally because there are many planes of time that can intersect with our linear plane of time in this world. But also he is almighty because he is is in three personages in order you can't rule in the three ultimate aspects of existence of beyond creation in creation and filling all dimensions of creation without being in personage in those three dimensions and so this is good news but i'm talking about the other symbol the positive symbol which is also the last letter of the most ancient language which is the alphabet of the Hebrew and of the Phoenicians and way back to 1500 BC, 2000 BC. It's the symbol of the cross just as we know it today. And what that symbol means is that God is so great that he could come into this world and humble himself more than you, a mere creature, and suffer more than you, a mere creature, on the cross so that you could choose to repent and receive his love, to receive forgiveness, to cry out and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Cleanse me of all my sins. Wash all my sins away. And he will. And he will fill your life with wholeness and peace instead of a grasping state of being that's like a black hole or like a cracked vessel that can hold no water. As it says of Israel when they were sinning against God in rebellion against them, the Lord says, by the Spirit through Jeremiah, you have hewn out for yourselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. But Christ says, whoever believes with their life into me, out of their innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And so God loved you enough to become a perfect atoning substitutionary sacrifice on the cross in Jesus Christ, who is the one and only true full expression of the one true God communicated in this earthly realm to his creation, to communicate on a limited creature level and on a more personal level 
that you can absorb because the glory of God the Father is so great. You, you would be, uh, in your physical body, you'd be burned to ashes. Okay, let's put it that way. This is good news. And this gospel that I'm telling you, or this good news that I'm telling you about, has been preached from the very beginning of time. From the time of Adam to now, it has been so that the message has been that there is only one true God and that he is holy and that he's merciful and that he will forgive the sins of those who repent and that it is only in God that there is the power to, re to forgive. And yes, they did offer innocent lambs, which was a symbol of their sin being transferred from them onto that innocent animal, but they knew the animal couldn't forgive them, but only God. The animal, the sacrifice of the animal, allowed their flesh to be cleansed so that the spirit could dwell with their soul and spirit so that they could be born again, which I illustrate as an open hand when you receive Christ, when you receive the one true eternal God, the Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you open up and you cry out and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Your soul becomes in a selfless state like this open hand from a selfish state like this fist. And when that happens, the Spirit of God comes to dwell with your soul. Now the hand can't close because you now have a new divine nature and that's what happened to them from the time of Adam till now. Except now after the cross and the atoning work of Christ on the cross, our soul and spirit can now be cleansed. So there's not just the dwelling of the spirit with your spirit that causes that state of a new nature, but the imbuing, the saturation, the indwelling of the spirit so it's good news that you can receive eternal life and that his love is so great that he humbled himself more than you a mere creature on the cross he suffered more than you a mere creature on the cross are you going to reject his love that is the very source of life and of intelligence and of all there is he's calling you are you thirsty? Don't let the temporal loves of this world quench your thirst because it will never satisfy your soul. Come to him just as you are with a true heart of repentance and he will forgive you. He will cleanse you and you will be filled with his spirit and that will satisfy you more than anything in this world when you know a relationship with him. So I'm calling you to come and to repent because the time of his return is very soon how could anyone want to reject God's love for a temporal fulfillment for a temporal bait that is used by the enemy to manipulate your life onto destruction and onto conformity to a nature that is contrary to life that leaves you in a place of everlasting torment that is worse than anything that you can experience in this physical realm that's what the people that have died and been verified to have died, have experienced that went to hell and God had mercy on them because he knew their heart was still open to the truth and could choose to receive him. So I'm sharing this good news with you. You can know joy unspeakable. You can know his peace. And he's calling you. Now is the time, not later. Now is the time to call on him with all your heart. So I'm going to have this video as a kind of a introductory video, I think, and then start another video, which will be the message. And so I do want to share at the end of this video that the messages I give, I give by the casting of Lot before God. This was often practiced by the nation of Israel, also referred to as the church in the Old Testament, in the Bible. It was practiced from the beginning of time by Abraham and others, I'm sure, as well. Certainly Moses and Joshua and others. 
and I do it with great reference. And the reason I cast lots is to get two chapters. I use two independent applications. And in great reverence before God, I cast lots to discover the two chapters that God wants that would bear witness with each other as to the message that he's wanting to give. And I meditate on those two chapters for a half an hour with very little preparation, and I speak. And so that's what I'm going to be doing today. And since I didn't speak this week, I'm going to be covering some of the chapters I got by a lot in the rest of the week as well. But I think I will call this first video the introductory video and use it maybe as a general video of introduction. But the other video that I will begin soon will have the message and so we'll go and we'll call this the end of this video now. Thank you for listening to this good news. And remember, you can go to ultimatemeaning.com. And if you go to the context section, you have some prayers there. You can pray with a nice music in the background. And if you do pray the sinner's prayer and you do receive Christ, the one true eternal God, Yahweh the Almighty, as he's described in the Old Testament, fill out the little email and let me know the good news that you've experienced reconciliation with God and his spirit come into your life and change you and make you his child, his servant, his love slave, the Lord and Savior of your life. Thank you for listening to this message. We'll go on with Go on, you can now watch the other message that it will be related, this introductory message.